Good morning. Lots of friendly hugs this morning. It's great to see. We are so glad you're here. And if you're a guest with us, we'd love for you to fill out a yellow connection card in the pew rack in front of you and drop it in one of the boxes or the offering plate. We're glad that you're here to worship with us this morning and hope that you find the message of the songs and the message of the hour to be encouraging and help you grow in your faith uh, today. Next Sunday is I Am Second Sunday. And we're excited to invite some friends to hear a testimony of what the Lord is doing in the lives of one of the people here in the congregation with you. And saying that, we also need more people to do the I Am Seconds. So we need some brave people that want to come up here and share their testimony. You don't have to be brave. It's okay. You can cry. You can shake. It's okay. I come up here every time, and I do it, and you're going to be fine. So we need some people willing to share their testimony, regardless if it is life-shattering or if it's just God's faithfulness throughout the years. We want to hear how God's been working in your lives. And so we would love for you to talk to Pastor Andy and say, hey, I'm willing to get up front and say what God has done in my life. I need someone so. for next week. So if I don't have anybody, we won't have one next week. So, all right. Wow, pressure. <laughs> <laughs> so all of you, think, if you haven't shared your testimony, then think about it. Next week could be it, like really fast, one and done. All right. Um, discipleship opportunities coming up. There is a lot going on for discipleship here in the church. Uh, we still have three more weeks of the Managing Money seminar that uh, Janelle is teaching. So if you want to get in on that, I've, it's been some great information so far. Uh, so that's three more weeks. That meets at 9 a.m. in the Halo classroom. And then on Wednesdays, we've got a lot of things. We've got Mommy and Me, Kids Quizzing, Come to the Water, and Youth Group all going on as well as praise team practice. So there's a lot happening on Wednesday evenings. The, um, the schedule's on the back of your bulletin of what times everything starts. And then coming up on October 15th, we have Getting to Know SBFN, which is our membership class. It helps you get to know the ministry here at South Bend First, as well as if you want to know more about the Church of the Nazarene, this is a great opportunity to learn more. You will have the opportunity afterwards to say, yeah, I want to be a member. I want to be a part of this. But you don't have to. Just come and get to know what the church is all about. And so that is October 15th, and you will need to RSVP for that because they order some lunch because it's a little bit longer of an after-church class. And then next Sunday is our prayer partner luncheon. So if you are part of our prayer partner ministry, we thank you for being a part of that, for ministering to our teens in that way. And so we want to honor you and let you have some time to kind of hang out with the teens, have a meal, and just have a conversation. So you should have gotten your invitation, but it is next week. And the youth group is providing the fried chicken and the mashed potatoes, so you'll just need to bring a side because it is a potluck. Teenagers, that's you too. <laughs> bring a side. It's a potluck. So it's going to be great. And then alabaster was last week. If you brought your alabaster boxes, we did collect a bunch. It was a really exciting service. And they raised, Sue, it was about $600, was collected. And that is to build churches and schools and hospitals around the world. And so that's just a really great ministry program here with the Church of the Nazarene. And if you forgot yours last week or you've got some pocket change, the box is outside in the foyer again today. And I think this is the last week for it. So if you want to participate in that offering, today is your last opportunity for this year. And then, <laughs> Sandy has an announcement. Good morning, everyone. Happy October 1st. And in line with October 1st, that is Pastor Appreciation Month. So I just wanted to put out a reminder that in the lobby, we do have cards for you to fill out. Um, and we have a nice little handout for you, 50, over 50 ways to appreciate your pastor. So feel free to grab one of those. And if you have completed cards, we have baskets that are sitting on the Welcome Center desk that you can pop those things into. And if you have anything extras and things you want to share and you would like me to share with the pastors, just get a hold of me and let me know. Thank you. All right. If there's no more announcements, we'll have our ushers for this morning's ties and offerings. Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity to give back what you have given to each one of us. We just ask that you touch each one. Lord, bless the gift and the giver and help each one to worship today um, in the way that you would be glorified. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with us again? First Peter 2 says this. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God, to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. Jesus himself is the true rock, and God is helping us to build our lives on him. Let's meditate on this.
just a few moments, I just want to encourage you to begin to settle your hearts, begin to focus in on Him and what God is wanting to do in your life this morning. And let's continue in worship as we lift Him up this morning, just lifting up Him with the, the song that the angels around the throne right now at this moment are singing. Let's join our voices again. Lord, this morning we stand here in your presence because you are here right now. We don't want to take that for granted. We don't want to forget about that. We don't want to just go through the motions this morning. <clears throat> Lord, we want to stand here in your presence with our hearts open wide to you, our spirits laid bare before you, all thoughts are known to you, all motives our actions, our deeds, Lord, all before you this morning. And 
God, we come to you because we know that, one, you are a just God, you are a righteous God, and God, you, um, you hate sin and you judge sin. Uh, Lord, you've judged it through your son, Jesus Christ, and God, when we come to you through him, Lord, our sin is judged, but it is also covered. It is also cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ, and so God, you're not only a just God and a righteous God, but you are a merciful God. You are a God of grace, and you have shown your grace to us. And God, we stand here before you this morning as people, recipients of that grace. And we give you thanks, and we give you praise. Our Father, we come before you this morning in this time because you are, as we've sung, you are our Father. And you hear and know all of our needs. And so, Lord, we bring those to you now in this time. And we want to remember the, the concerns that are represented here across this congregation. We continue to pray for Sue Harris, just to touch upon her body and bring healing to her legs and, and the things that she's been going through. Lord, we pray for her husband, Jerry, to continue to be with him. Father, we lift up uh, Janet Dodd's mom, Jerry. And, Lord, maybe in these last days or weeks, however long she has left, Lord, as she deals with pancreatic cancer. Lord, would you be near to her, comfort her, um, strengthen her, Lord. Help her to put her faith and trust in you if she has never done that. Lord, we also lift up Mary Nefrady and ask that you continue to be with her and help her uh, recover from this fall, that her bones would knit together well and she would not have a lot of pain. We pray for Deb Stone, Lord, that you would continue to touch her, her mind, her brain, and help her as she heals. We Pray for Reggie this morning and his family relationships, Lord. We just uh, we know that you have a desire for godly relationships and ones that honor you and families that work together. So, Lord, just be with Reggie and his family this morning, we pray. God, we pray for Clint's friend, Barry, with stomach cancer. What a terrible thing. And, Lord, may your mercy be at work in that situation. Continue to work through Clint, God. May he be an encouragement to uh, his friend, telling him about you and the hope that we have in you. We pray for Roosevelt Mel Connor's great grandson, Lord, with these very serious issues that he's going through. We don't understand exactly why that he's having these outbursts, but Lord, you do. And so, would you go and provide the right treatment, the right care, the right people, and just touch his little life this morning? We pray. And we also want to pray for Bobby Hale, Lord, a longtime member of this church. Her and her husband, Lord, served so faithfully and sacrificed so much to that we're here today, in part because of their faithfulness. Uh, just be with her in these days as she struggles with dementia and maybe in the uh, last time of her life, Lord, this last season. Just, uh, just be uh, the God of all comfort and grace to her in this time. Lord, I pray that you'd help us as we come to your word this morning, that we would come to it with um, open hearts and minds, that we would not have any obstacles in the way, but Lord, we would just truly be wanting to hear from you and wanting to, to, uh, to learn from you, to take your yoke upon us, your teaching, your, your way, as the song says, Lord. We want your way to be our way. We ask these things now in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. Well, this morning, uh, the children can be dismissed for children's church. Uh, many of you know that uh, at our church here, we take um, evangelism seriously. We take discipleship seriously. Evangelism, if you don't know what that means... Uh, the evangel means the good news. And so when we share the good news with somebody, the good news about Jesus Christ, that's evangelism. It's you and I telling others about what Jesus has done in our lives and how to come into a saving relationship with him. And discipleship then is to become like a disciple, like the disciples we read about in scripture, those who follow Jesus, who walked in the way. And so as a church, we do what we can to help you uh, develop and grow in your relationship with the Lord. And much of that is incumbent upon you, right? Taking part in the means of grace and reading scripture and prayer. But as a church, we want to help disciple you. One of the things that uh, we do when people come to know Christ is we have a new believers class that meets periodically called Foundations Class. Pastor Rick and uh, Dean uh, teach that class. And so they uh, uh, will have that periodically throughout the, the year so that folks that have come to the Lord can be uh, grounded in their faith. But a new resource that we have that we're going to be giving out is called a book called The Journey, and it says Discovering What It Means to Follow Jesus, and this was written by um, Brent St. Clair's dad, Bob St. Clair, Robert St. Clair. He is a Nazarene pastor. 
He's supposed to be retired, but uh, <laughs> Nazarene pastors, I guess we never retire, so see what I have to look forward to. But um, he is here today, and I asked Bob if he would come up, and uh, we'll need that purple mic, Barbie, uh, if he would come up and just share just a little bit about that, since we have the author of the book here, just to talk about what the, um, the reason behind him writing this. So can you welcome Bob St. Clair up here? Come on, you can come on up here. You're used to being in the pulpit, so come on up. <laughs> All right. I'll let you have Thank you so the, much. Yep. Well, it was about two years ago that uh, I was serving in a uh, Nazarene church as an associate pastor. And uh, the pastor called me into his office one day, and he said, uh, Bob, take a look at these books. And he had three books on his desk. And he said, I'd like you to take them with you and just take a look through them, look at them closely, and then meet with me whenever you're finished, and uh, I'd like to talk to you uh, about what they do and how they do it, and get uh, recommendations from you. So the books all had to do with helping a new Christian, somebody who had just accepted Jesus Christ as their savior. How do you help that person to grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ? Right. How do you help them to get a good start, so to speak, with Jesus? And uh, personally, I wasn't raised in a church, and I just began to hear about Jesus when I was in high school. As a sophomore in high school, I asked Jesus to come into my heart and my life to forgive me. I heard the gospel message, and I thought, if that's, if that's really true, it's got to be the greatest thing I've ever heard. And I gave myself to that. I gave myself to God. But I'll tell you what the problem was. Within days... I was wondering, I was thinking, I was asking the question, what do I do now? <laughs> I'm a Christian, but what now? What does it mean? And so it began to fill in for me over the, the months and years, really, what does it mean to be a Christian? How do you pursue Jesus Christ? And the books that the, uh, the senior pastor gave me to look over, they all had to do with reaching out to a person who has accepted Christ in terms of guiding them in their new found Christian life. And so he asked me if I would write a book. And uh, what he didn't understand was that years earlier, it was in my first church, and I served for 41 and a half years full time. And it was in that first church that, that I had this idea. I don't know where it came from or why it came, but I thought and I prayed, God, if, if you would give me the privilege, I don't know why, but I'd, I'd like to write a book and have that book published. And that was that. Well, being a pastor is somewhat busy. And so through the years, I, I, I worked hard and, and, and I did the best I could in terms of being a pastor and reaching out and love to people and helping them in their spiritual lives. And, and, uh, but you, you know one thing I never did? I never wrote that book. I just put it on the, the shelf and I wasn't really concerned about it and it just never happened. So then I retired. And what my fellow Nazarene pastor didn't understand was this was a dream. He had no idea, but God was using him to fulfill this dream that I've had through the years. God is so good and so, so gracious. Anyway, the journey. Uh, this has eight chapters, and each chapter has to do with various an area that uh, I thought was really, really very important for the new Christian. So I talked to them in this book about their new life in Christ. I talked to them about other areas such as the Bible, what that is, what it means, how God wants to use it in our hearts and lives, how it can guide us. I talk about prayer. I talk about being a part of the people of God. In other words, the body of Christ. What's that mean? What does that look like to be in the church? And I talk about uh, knowing God's will. Can we know it? How do we know it? 
And so these are eight very short, concise chapters on that type of areas. And so anyway, this book is available through Barnes and Noble and through Amazon. And uh, I've got a couple or three churches now that are giving these out, and I praise God for that. And uh, when I agreed to write the book, my thought was, wouldn't that be something if I could have the chance of impacting more lives for Jesus? Wouldn't that be something if I could actually write something that would help a new Christian in those first weeks and months of their journey with Jesus? Wouldn't that be something? So I thank God for the opportunity uh, that he's given me and thank him for the book and uh, now it's up to him to use right. it. Thanks. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, brother. Yep. All right. Well, I just want to, again, say thanks to, to Bob for uh, writing this and for sharing this and uh, his wife Jeannie is here, so we want to recognize her. And um, we've, the church has, we bought 20 of them to give out, so, and then we'll keep purchasing when they run out. But if you would like your own copy, I'm going to encourage you to buy your own copy. So the ones we bought are for new believers. And, uh, you know, when you give your tithes and offerings, some of that money partly goes to that. So, again, how am I contributing? How am I partnering with the church? Through giving is one of the ways, because some of the resources we're able to buy and to purchase and to give to people uh, when they come to the Lord. So just wanted you to kind of get to meet Bob. Get to meet somebody of the resource that we're handing out to people and uh, pray that this book would be fruitful in people's lives and we'll see people come to know Jesus and walk closely with him. All right? Well, would you turn in your Bibles with me to Ephesians chapter 5? Uh, it's page 1823 in the Pew Bible. I encourage you to turn there. And um, we're going to turn there in just a minute, uh, but I want to have that open for us and we'll look at that here in just a moment. But we are in the uh, middle of a series right now called uh, Finding Balance, Finding Balance. I guess if I turn this on, it works. All right. <laughs> and really, uh, finding balance is just kind of a way to, to catch people's attention. A lot of people are looking for, they feel like their lives are spiraling out of control. Things are, are going haywire or crazy. I love the line in that song. Uh, you know, I have got, uh, spoke about uh, God speaks into the chaos and things fall into line. People are looking for that. They're looking for some stability. And so this really isn't about like some sort of, uh, you know, yoga, finding balance or anything like that. This is really about uh, priorities, this series. It's really about how are you prioritizing your life in a way that brings you to a place where not just balance, but stability in God. And so I hope as we go through this that you're looking for that. You are beginning to apply the principles and the word of God to your heart. I'm so appreciative to Pastor Rebecca for last week, uh, what she shared about godly families. It was a powerful word for us, right? How the earthly family is intended to be a, a picture for us of God's family and vice versa. God's family and what we see in the family of God is a picture for earthly families. I also loved what she said last week, that anything that disrupts, denigrates, or attacks the family is attacking God's very own plan and design for people, right? Did you catch that last week? Did you catch it again? Anything that disrupts, attacks, or denigrates the family is an attack on God's very plan for people and for relationships, okay? So whenever you see something, listen carefully in our world. If you hear something, see something someone is saying that attacks parents, Parents' rights, something that attacks the family and wants to do away with the Western prescribed family, if you will. Uh, it's not Western prescribed, it's God prescribed, but that's some of the language that we hear. Anything that attacks children, seeks to destroy God's image in them, to confuse them, to cause them uh, trouble and pain or whatever, anything that attacks that, literally anything that breaks up the family, that is not from God, that is from the enemy. The devil. Amen? Amen? So pay attention, right? And so I loved what she shared about that. And so prioritizing God's intention for families, how vital that would be. Just think about 
you know, I know the people that are teaching in school these days, you hear reports about, I just saw this week, teachers on TikTok saying they can't hardly take it anymore because school is just out of control. The kids are out of control. And part of that, they blame the pandemic, you know, being off of school for a while and stuck behind TV or your computer screens. And that's partly true. But some of that chaos and some of that brokenness is starting at home. Imagine if we prioritized God and we prioritized families in the way that he intended, how much different families and schools and society would be, right? God's priorities, God's way brings balance, stability, strength to us. Now, you can go back and watch that message or any of our messages if you want, so I'd encourage you if you didn't get to see that one last week to do that. We also, a couple weeks ago, looked at how uh, balance uh, we see, what we see really should be from the Lord, right? We don't want worldly balance, we're not trying to just, you know, uh, reorganize our lives in a way that's a little bit more efficient or whatever. We're, we're not focused on, you know, we're trying to do meditation and, and just juggling all of our responsibilities. That's not the kind of balance we're looking for. We're looking for godly balance. We saw that godly balance is to have a firm foundation. It is to have a firm footing in him. And so he gave the illustration of trying to balance on one foot, how easily you could be knocked over, right? You might be balancing for a time, but anything and everything can come along and easily knock you over. But if you have both feet planted, right, it's very, very difficult to knock you off. And so that's the godly balance that we're pursuing. The Bible tells us, we saw last week, how the psalmist says, I waited patiently for the Lord. I pursued the Lord. I was looking for what he wanted. I waited upon him. I was listening to him. We talked about that a few months ago. Uh, I waited for the Lord. He looked to me and he heard my cry. He lifted me out of the mess that I was in, right? The slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. And then what does he do? He sets my feet on a rock and makes my footsteps firm. If you want that in your life, you're tired of bouncing around, you're tired of chaos and, and disorganization, you're tired of, you know, I get things right on Sunday and then Monday I messed up, you have to allow God, pursue his priorities, allow him to ground your life in him. The psalmist says again, I keep my eyes always on the Lord, right? I don't look to the left or the right, I'm looking to the Lord. With him at my right hand, what? I will not be shaken. You want that in your life, to, to go through life that no matter what comes at you, I will not be shaken. He says again, the, those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, a great mountain, right? Which cannot be shaken but endures forever. We have an enduring foundation in God if we prioritize God first in our lives. So where are your feet planted today? Take stock for a moment. Look back at your life this last week. Where have your feet been planted? Have you been knocked off balance? Have you been pushed around by, by uh, circumstances in your life? Or have you been rooted and grounded, right? We can put our feet, we can plant them in many places. We can plant them in the squishy, ever-shifting quicksand of culture and pop psychology. We can root our feet. Young people, listen. You can root your feet in what your friends tell you or think about you. But do you want to? You can even root yourself in your own thoughts about yourself. I heard this week a really good message uh, by Reverend Dr. Dan Boone, uh, who's president of Trevecca Nazarene, but he was preaching at Olivet Nazarene University this last week during their revival services. I would encourage you to look that message up. It was last Tuesday. Let me see the date here. Uh, 9-18-23. Um, but it was a great message, and he was talking about identity. He's talking to, uh, you know, 3,000 young people who are awash in a confused and chaotic society. Uh, that's telling them their identity is this or their identity is that, and to, the thing they should pursue above all things is their own identity. And he said this, and I quote from him, At the core of our cultural anxiety today is a particular understanding about what it means to be a human being. There's a particular understanding at the core of our society about what it means to be an under, a human being. And he goes on and he says this from Alan Noble. He says, the cultural message today is, you are your own, you belong to yourself. I am my own, I belong to myself. That's the message of our culture today. So we need to find ourselves. 
We need to find and express ourselves. And we need to do things that get affirmation for ourselves, right? Because it's all about uh, what it means for us to be center of all of these things. He says this, this age of individualism has delivered us into the age of the sovereign self. And if this is true, then we will always be chasing the world's affirmation. If, if we put ourselves at the center, in our own affirmation, our own identity at the center, we're always going to be chasing the world's affirmation. If this is where you are grounding yourself, you're, you're never going to have firm footing because the ground beneath you is always cha changing. It's always shifting, right? You will always have unstable ground. You will always see yourself stumbling and falling as you move along in life. The Bible says that we can have a different grounding, that our identity is, is different. It says this, you are not your own. You were bought at a price. You're not your own. Your goal in life is not to see, seek self-actualization and self-affirmation because you're not your own. You are you are somebody else's. You are God's. You were bought at a price. The price was the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ of Nazareth on your behalf. And so you're not your own. You belong to the deep, abiding care of God. Do you believe that today? God loves you. God cares about you. He knows you better than you know yourself or than anyone knows you. And so find your identity in him. Let him establish your feet on the rock of Jesus. That is true balance. That is true stability. Find your balance in him. And so we do that. We're going to be looking at, we've looked at some. We're going to look at some more in the next few weeks. We, we talked about doing that by, by prioritizing God first, right? Above all things, prioritizing godly families, whether that's your biological family that you have or God has given all of us a family. Some are biological, others, it's, we're all a part of the family of God and the church. And so even if you're single, you're a part of a family. Pastor Rebecca reminded us that. So prioritizing God at the center of our families and family the way he intended it. Today, though, I want us to look at setting our lives according to God's time. Setting our lives... According to God's time. You still have your Bibles open to Ephesians chapter 5 there. If you closed it or you want to look it up again, it's page 1823 in the Pew Bible. God has a lot to say about time. He created it, so he should have a lot to say about it, right? God has a lot to say about time. Look with me at Ephesians chapter 5, beginning at verse 15. He says this. He says, be very careful then how you live. Be very careful then how you live. If you recall, just a couple weeks ago, uh, in the first sermon of this series, uh, this kind of harkens back to that first sermon from the prophet Haggai, right? It, where Haggai said, uh, be very careful then how you live, right? Give careful thought to your ways. That sermon that he gave, a series of four sermons in the fall or the autumn of the year he gave, he said, give careful thought to your ways. Here we go, all the, way, all the way into the New Testament. The Apostle Paul is writing. God inspired him. He says, be very careful then how you live. Are you giving careful thought to your ways? Would you say right now, if you looked at your life and the events of this last week, were you being very careful about how you live? Right? Right? What does he go? He says, he goes on there. He says, be very careful then how you live. How? Not as unwise, but as wise. You see, how we live is a choice. How you go through life, how you interact with others, the, the, the career choices, the, the, uh, the, the, the entertainment choices, all, all of the things that you do, all of that is a choice, and we can either do it in a way, there's two different ways, we can either do it as an unwise, in an unwise way, or we can do it in a wise way. The Apostle Paul says there's two ways. Don't live your life in an unwise way, but live it in a wise way. Then he goes on, look at verse 16 there. He says, live not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because these days 
are evil. The Bible here is talking about time. Every opportunity, every moment, every minute in time. Make the most of every opportunity. Have you ever considered that time is a resource? You ever thought about it that way? Some, I'm sure some of you have. I'm sure maybe you've heard, uh, heard people say that, but that time is a resource. Time is a resource, but it's not an unlimited one, right? Time is a resource, but it is not an unlimited resource to us. The Bible says this. Uh, this is the prayer of the psalmist. Lord, remind me. How brief my time on earth will be. It's not unlimited. Remind me that my days are numbered. How fleeting my life is. You have made my life no longer than the width of my hand. My entire lifetime is just a moment to you. At best, each of us is but a breath. Our days are numbered. That's not a threat. That's just reality. That's not God saying, you know, uh, hey, your days are numbered and then they're going to be up. He's saying, listen, you have so many days. That's all you have. Your time is a resource, but your time is limited. And so this morning, I want to encourage you to give careful thought for a moment about this resource, this invaluable, not unlimited, a.k.a. limited <laughs> resource. When you think about resources, do you treat all resources the same? How many of you treat uh, the money that you have, your cash, the same way that you treat a dinner napkin? Anybody here wipe your mouth and then throw away your money, you know, use money for your napkin, right? No, that's, that's crazy, right? Uh, you, you don't treat all resources the same, right? Some resources are more precious than others. Money is one that we treat very precious because money is a limited resource. You have to work very hard to get what you earn, and today, more than ever, is it's worth less and less, right? Freedom is a resource that we have that's not, that it has a limit, right? And so freedom, is how do you exercise your freedom? How do you live into your freedom? Your health is a resource. How do you steward the health that God has given you, your body, your, your life, right? Some resources are more precious than others. And there's a difference between, as we said, limited and unlimited resources. I don't know if some of you remember a few months ago when uh, Pastor and his wife, Mr. Cole, were here, uh, they're missionaries in Africa. And one of the things they shared in a Sunday school class, and I think he shared it here in the service a little bit, was about uh, these villages and how they, they go in and they can provide water, clean drinking water to these villages. Prior to setting up a well in this village, the, the people, the children, or often the women, would have to walk miles and carry like a five-gallon bucket on their head to, to bring this water back. And so in America, water seems like it's an unlimited resource, doesn't it? Right? I mean, you brush your teeth, you leave the water on, some of us, right? Uh, you know, we're just always wasting water. We're watering our lawns, right? <laughs> Uh, which is fine. I'm just saying. We treat it like it's an unlimited resource. But if you're from an African village where you don't have a well in your village there, uh, it, it, you treat it very differently because you don't want to have to walk miles to get another bucket of water. It's, so you're very careful with that. God reminds us that time is a resource. Your time here on this earth is a resource. God says... Be very careful how you live. Make the most of every opportunity. Now, of course, I'm speaking to all of us this morning in this message, but I'm, I want to speak especially to young people, okay? So if you're a young person and you can just categorize yourself how you want, okay? I'm not going to categorize you, okay? So you can be, have gray hair and think you're a young person. That's fine, okay? But if you are a young person in age, you might think that you have all the time in the world, and it seems that way. I mean, I remember when I was a, you know, a kid or especially a teenager in college, it just seems like you have all the time in the world. And maybe you do have a lot of time left, right? But maybe not. We all know 
Young people's lives are tragically cut short from time to time. But even if you listen to me, even if you live to a very old age, and I hope that you do, ask any person here today in their 70s or their 80s or their 90s, and they will ask the question, where in the world did the time go? I'm 49, and I, I still, like, you know, my freshman year of college, it seems like it was yesterday. High school, seems like yesterday. I can remember things from my childhood just like as vividly today, almost as if they're, they're happening right now. And, and yet here I am, and I've got less life to live than I've already lived. It's just, it doesn't matter what age you are, but, but time is going to pass by so quickly because time is a limited resource. And no matter how young you are, we need to consider how are we using our, that resource that God has given us. You see, there's two ways to use a resource, aren't there? We can either spend it or we can invest it. You ever hear the phrase, we, we, we use it all the time, right? I'm going to spend some time doing this. You ever think about that? When you say that? You, you are spending a resource that is a, a limited quantity. You're going to use it in some way. And so we can either spend the resource or we can invest it. What's the difference? Well, when we spend something, we use it, and then it's gone, right? Uh, my daughter introduced me to this game. It's just, I don't know, it's called the watermelon game. I'm not sure. It's a phone app game. Um, and so what you do is you have fruit that drops down the screen, and you start with, I think it's, a, what does it start with? A grape, yeah, a grape, and then two grapes, they come together, and they make a strawberry. Two strawberries make a kiwi. Two kiwis make a... Uh, peach, two peaches make an apple, two apples make a... Anyway, so <laughs> sounds really awesome, doesn't it? And so these things drop down and they combine... Anyway, introduced me to this game a couple weeks ago. And so I can spend time, and I had spent some time playing that game. And when I'm done playing that game, I've spent some time. <laughs> That's about all I can say. I did make a couple of watermelons along the way, <laughs> but, um, but I've spent it and it's gone. I have nothing to show for it, right? We, we spend time. We use that resource. We can either spend it and use it and it's gone, or we can invest it. What does it mean to invest? When you invest in something, you, you use it in a way so as to get a return, Right? If I invest my money, I take my money, I invest it in something, whatever that might be, uh, but I, I use it in a way so that I will get a return, so that I will get something back. And usually, often, the reason we invest it is to get something back that's of greater value than of the initial investment, right? You don't invest your money in, in you know, stocks or something so that you can lose money. That happens sometimes. But we invest it so that we can get a greater return. God tells us, to be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. And the question for us this morning is, how are you using one of your most precious resources, which is time? Would you say you're using it wisely or unwisely? Would you say that you're just simply spending time or would you say you are investing God wants, he cares about you. He cares about these things. That's why he tells us about them, right? Now, one of the things that financial advisors will tell you, and if you are interested in, in godly principles for managing money, Janelle St. Clair's class uh, is about halfway through, but I'm sure you can pick up some good information. It's taking place on Sunday mornings at 9 o'clock the, off the gymnasium there. Uh, so we have some good information there. But, but any financial advisor will tell you this. It's never too late to start investing. It's never too late to start investing. But they will also tell you that the earlier you start investing, the better, right? I mean, you can get to retirement and you can still be making investments and still getting some return on your, your uh, money that you're investing. But, but it's a whole lot better if you start when you're in your, you know, your teens and you start earning money, you start putting it away. Or your 20s or you're just getting married, whatever. If you're investing early on because of compound interest. 
That investment early on, it grows and it compounds and it grows. And so you get a much greater return if you start early than if you start late, right? Money, you invest it now, you get some return. But if you invest young, you're going to get a greater return. Think about your skills. Uh, you know, we hear of people who they retire and they decide, you know, I never learned how to play piano. And so I want to learn how to play piano. And so they start learning, right? Uh, but if you know anything about learning an instrument later in life, uh, it's, a, it's a challenge. Our bla- brains are not as flexible. Our fingers are not as nimble. And so, um, you know, you're going to learn how to play it if you really work at it. But it's not going to be the same as if, if a young person, you know, at the age of five starts learning piano and then really invests in it. Because, because when they've started that young, they have the ability, but they also have the time, the length of time to equal, to come to mastery at that skill. Paul says, make the most of every opportunity. And so I want to say to you again, especially if you're young, make the most of every opportunity of your life now. Start investing in the things of God and what God wants for your life now. If you want to find godly balance in your life at any age, That stability that comes from having both feet grounded on the rock, uh, your life to make the most of it, then you need to begin investing your time in a way that honors God, in a way that he intended for you. In the next couple weeks, we're going to go a little bit deeper into what I want to share here as I'm kind of wrapping things up. But there are two kinds of time, okay? Okay? There are two kinds of time. The first kind of time is, and this is, in, I'm talking about scripture. Uh, there are two kinds of time in scripture revealed. There's chronos or chronos, however you want to say it. Chronos is, that's the root word of chronology, right, or chronological. Chronos is linear time. It's sequential time, right? It's the minutes, the days, the years, the months, whatever. It's like the time that, you know, it goes on in a, in a, in a line, Think about a timeline, right? We look at study timelines. There's a really neat timeline on the wall, on the other side of that wall out there, the hallway. You see it when you come in. Um, Chronos is linear time, okay? So that's one kind of time we see in Scripture. But Scripture uses another word for time often, and it is kairos. These are Greek words, by the way. Uh, There's chronos, linear time, but then there's kairos, which is God's time. Kairos is talking more, uh, it's not linear time, but it's talking about significant moments in time. You might think about, um, I don't know if you've ever done this, you're reading an article on, uh, online, maybe it's a newspaper. Sometimes at the beginning of that article, it'll say, you know, five to seven minutes to read, right? It, it tells you how much linear time, how much chronos it's going to take to read that article. You might think about it in terms of reading scripture. You set aside, you know, maybe 10 minutes a, a day, maybe in the morning or the evening or at lunchtime, and you're setting aside chronos to read the Bible. But what happens in that chronos, those 10 minutes, can become kairos. Those 10 minutes that you invest in God's word and allow God to then pour back into you, that chronos can become kairos, right? Because chronos, if we're investing it wisely, can lead to kairos. It can lead to those, that, that God moment, that significant moment when suddenly, you know, maybe you've read that passage many times before, but in that moment, the Holy Spirit just uh, through experience or whatever just opens up your heart and your mind in a way that you didn't expect or anticipate and something significant God does in your life. Think about, again, I use an example, a personal example, getting married, right? Uh, uh, your wedding day. That is a chronos moment, right? It's, it's a linear time. You've been building up to that, and the day unfolds, and you, know, you get ready in the morning and all that kind of stuff, and then you have the wedding, and you know, the timing of the wedding, you've all planned out. That's a chronos thing, but, but a wedding and, and a marriage, it becomes a kairos moment when God is invited into it. it. It's greater than just that linear time because God is there because it becomes a significant moment with what is happening in that exact time. Kronos leads to Kairos. Investing, young people especially, but all of us, investing our minutes, our days, our years in godly things leads to godly moments 
in our lives, moments where that investment comes to fruition, where we realize, if you will, the earnings that come with investing in godly things. Think about time. I've already mentioned time invested in reading and studying and memorizing scripture. What does it yield? Right? It yields faith. The Bible says that uh, when we read God's word, it produces faith. It brings hope in our lives. It brings freedom to us. It brings life. Think about time invested in growing a godly family. Again, whether that's a bio- partly the biological family or growing the family of God of which you're a part. What it yields is it yields, uh, if you have a God-centered family, it yields faith to your children. And maybe even hopefully your grandchildren, right? It brings blessing to generations. The Bible talks about how the the sins of the fathers is visited to the third and fourth generation. Again, you look at our society and you see broken families often produce children, sadly, who are broken. And so our schools and our society and systems are broken. But if we have godly families, it leads to blessing of the generations. It leads to the expansion of God's family. As Pastor Rebecca reminded us last week, it leads, uh, gives peace to your children. Godly priorities, investing your time in godly ways, brings peace and protection to your children and to those around you. Think about time invested in godly relationships. Deepening of those friendships, right? Going deep, uh, being, uh, giving opportunity for mutual encouragement, to, to care for one another, to bear one another up, to, to help one another, to pray for one another, to support one another. Uh, we've invested in godly relationships. Our Kronos time becomes Kairos time. Think about investing time into your calling. Do you realize that all of us have a calling from God? Not all of us are called to be pastors or missionaries or whatever, but we all have a calling That's what the word vocation means. Voca, voice, right? It's a calling from God on your life. Are you pursuing the calling of God on your life? And it could very well be where you're at right now in your career or your job. But but do you see it as a calling from God? Because when you invest your chronos into your calling, God is glorified. You lead a fulfilling life. Others are blessed because you are utilizing the gifts and the calling that he has upon you. You've invested the Kronos and you get the Kairos. Investing your time in church. Growing in your knowledge and in your faith. Encouraging one another and being encouraged. Uh, getting the chance to build others up. You see, church isn't just about coming here and what you can get out of it. That's not even primarily what it's about. It's about being a part of the family, the body, right? And so we're mutually building each other up. And we're expanding God's family. And I could go on and on and on this morning. But the thing I'm driving at this morning is that you and I need to give careful thought to that very precious resource, time. How are you investing? How are you spending the time that God has given you? Would you bow your heads with me? Lord, this moment has been a moment in time, Kronos, God, that we have invested in. We've pushed other things aside. We've made room in our calendars. We, we could have been sleeping in or we could have been doing something else, watching pregame stuff. I don't know. But we've chosen to invest in your time. And, and God, this time together has become a God moment as you have spoken to us, as we've sung your praises. We've had an opportunity that, that, that so many other people haven't had yet today to lift up your name, to to glorify and praise your name. God, we've had an opportunity because we've invested to to hear from your word, to to be challenged and encouraged, to to see a smiling face here, or to to pray with one another, God. And and so we thank you that you take something as simple and mundane as chronos, chronological time. And God, when we invest it and use that resource wisely, Lord, you turn it into something amazing. Lord, I pray for all of us gathered here. It's so easy just to spend time. It's so easy to waste time. Lord, our our world is full of time wasters. But I pray, Lord, that you would help us to begin to see time in a different way. It's your resource you've given to us. You said our days are numbered. You know exactly what they are. They're, They're here today and gone tomorrow. Lord, I pray that you'd begin to help us to invest that time wisely. God, there's some young people here that have choices to make about uh, 
maybe it's relationships, maybe it's a, a future or schooling or work or jobs or, uh, Lord, uh, whatever it might be, I pray that you begin to help them to think, have a forward-thinking mind that considers your way and your plan for them. Father, there's also some folks here, like myself and others, that are, have lived a lot of that time already. We've used up a lot of that resource not as much left, but God, you want us to maximize and invest the time that we have left. I pray that there'd be nobody here that would just see their life as a waste. I don't have much time left, so I'm just going to just kind of spend it on myself, sitting on the couch or watching game shows, whatever it might be. Lord, I pray that we would be investing our time in you and in the kingdom and in others so that lives will be blessed and changed as a result. Thank you, Lord, this morning for the investment that Bob St. Clair made in writing that book, Making in Other Lives. Thank you for the investment of my family and Barbie's family that has poured into us hours, countless hours of prayer, support, love. I pray that all of us across this room would be pouring into others in the same way. We thank you so much that you made this time amazing. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks so much for being here. Again, uh, make sure that you uh, uh, check the, the bulletin, what's going on, and so we don't miss anything like that. And we look forward to seeing you guys back here next Monday, or Sunday. <laughs> Sorry. I'm thinking about tomorrow. <laughs>